619 Grand Avenue Church of Christ. We're thankful and pleased with you with visiting with us tonight on YouTube and streaming. We pray that something will be said that will be beneficial to you in your walk with Christ this tonight. The lesson will be studied from we come out of Romans chapter 3, verses the book of chapter Romans 3, rather. And we'll be coming out of the court setting. So if you are not a member of the Lord's Church, we want to say you are our honored guest. We are thankful and grateful for your viewing this worship, this class session tonight. We pray that something will be said to help you in your walk. And that something will touch you in your heart that will convince you that, that, that you should turn your life over to Christ to become a child of His. Before we get started, let us say a prayer. I have the Father, we come thank you for this day. We thank life, Pedro Spent, Father. Father, we thank you for the day that which was and promised unto us, Father, but because of your grace, your love, your mercy, your long suffering, you have shown toward us that you, that you have allowed us to see another day. It's because of your goodness, Father, not because of our goodness, but because of your goodness that you allowed us to see this day. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son Jesus Christ down to this sin cursed earth to die for our sins, to have our sins washed away, that we may have the right to the tree of life to be reconciled back to you, Father. Thank you, Father, for giving us the Holy Spirit and navigates and guides us through the day and through the night, Father. Continue to bless us, Father, give us of all our sins we commit daily, whether our omission or our commission, Father. Bless us in this class tonight. We study the book of Romans. Bless us that your spirit will guide us in this study, Father. That we get something to edify us and uplift us, Father. That we be beneficial to us in our walk. In your Son Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. So it's good to be here tonight to Step another portion of God's word. And I say we're coming out of Romans chapter 3. This is Paul is the writer of this book. And you notice this book is talking about a lot of things that's going on in this day and time that we, that we can add to our lives. In this day and time, we live in a world where people have a belief that they can do whatever they want and not be judged for it. They feel they will still be saved anyway. They feel that once they're saved, they're always saved. And that's just not true. The Bible does not teach that once you're saved, you're always saved. The only way you're always saved is by continually obeying God's word. Which what I'm saying is you can't be saved and go out there and do what you want to do and not suffer no consequences. If, you, if you're supposed to be saved, you got to have a changed life. So if you're still doing what you want to do, and think that you're saved, the Bible tells us that God got angels in the dungeon because they didn't want to do what they were supposed to do. Satan was once an angel in heaven. And look what happened to him. He got kicked out of, out of heaven because he didn't he wanted to do what he wanted to do. So it's not once we're saved, we're always saved. You got if you're obeying continuously obeying God's word, doing his will, that's the way you can always be saved. So we want to talk about that about how people feel today that they can do whatever they want. That once they're saved, they're always saved. But we in the church, we know that to be false. In this lesson, we will see that all men are under sin. We're going to look back into the Bible times and visit the city of Rome. During the time when Paul was addressing the Jews about them being under sin, just as the Gentiles. We have to understand this, this is the, uh, the uh, context of this is the Jews were the chosen people of God. And they felt that they were special, that the Gentiles were beneath them. The Jews felt that they could do anything they want without suffering any consequences. But Paul comes in addressing the Jews about being under sin, just as the Gentiles. So you can imagine what they are Jews and Jews were feeling like when Paul came in and told them that you are under sin, just as the Gentiles are. So we will see that as a state, as they stated, Paul tells the Jews, you are no better than the Gentiles. And like I said, we're going to look at this from a court setting. And you know when you go to a court setting, you have a judge, you have a jury, you have a, a, a defense lawyer, and you have a prosecutor. And the thing goes along with the court setting, you have objections, you have verdicts, 
that the, the jury may, makes. So we're going to look at this from a court setting. Here in Romans 3, you see Paul has been teaching that the Jews are under sin just as the Gentiles. And he is anticipating the Jews to be objecting to some of the things that he is going to be saying. That he has been teaching regarding their state of sin. But you and I must understand that the Jews, being the chosen people of God, they felt they had it made. And you know how we are today? Well, we are blessed tremendously. We tend to think in our minds that we got it made. That God got special favor on us. But the Bible do say that God blesses those the just and he blesses the unjust. He reigns on the just and he reigns on the unjust. So just because you're being blessed, don't, don't get content and think that you got it made like these Jews were. They were the chosen people of God. They felt they had it made. They felt they could do anything they wanted. And still receive the promises of God. But when it came to the Gentiles, they would agree that the Gentiles are not God's people. They would agree that the Gentiles are beneath them. But the Bible, they did not realize that God had a plan to bring the Gentiles in all along. So we can't get content with the fact that things are going well in life, that we just got it made. There's a continuously, we got to continuously study, we got to continuously obey God's word, continue to try to get to know God even better. So when it came to the Gentiles, they would agree that what Paul had said about the Gentile state of sin, but that he moved to speak about their being guilty of sin, just as the Jew, Gentiles, the Jews would then have some objections to which they would want Paul to respond to. You know that in the court setting when the, uh, uh, the prosecutor comes up and grills the, the witnesses, asks them all sorts of questions, trying to prove his point, trying to convince that the defendant is guilty as charged. But then when the defense lawyer would come up and, and uh, cross-examine the witness, the uh, uh, prosecutor may have some objection. They may object to what the defense lawyer may say, or the defense lawyer may object to what the prosecuting lawyer was saying. But the Jews, in the same fashion as Paul has stated, that they are under sin, just as the Gentiles. But they got some objections. When you read Romans chapter three, verses one through two, where the Bible says, "What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision?" Verse 2, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. See, the Jews, uh, Paul is telling them, what, what advantage do you have, Jew? What advantage do you have over the Gentile just because you are the chosen people of God? What advantage do you have, Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? See, the design of this, what advantage the design of the first part of this chapter is to answer some of the objections which might be offered by Jews to the statement in the last chapter. The first objection is that stated in, the, in this verse, and you would naturally ask, if the view which the apostle had given were correct, what special benefit could the Jew derive from his religion? The objection would arise particularly from the position of advance, that it's a pagan to do the things required by the law. He would be treated as if he had been circumcised. See, the Jews would object and say, the Gentiles, they are uncircumcised. The Jews up under the law were circumcised. They were the chosen people of God. So he said, what advantage then had the Jew? Or what profit had there of circumcision? Much in every way, because they unto them were committed the oracles of God. See, the Jews we realized they were special people in their mind. They were the chosen people of God misunderstood why God chose them first. It wasn't God didn't choose the Jews first because they were such special and such good people. Those were the people that God decided to start with. But all along, God got a plan to bring the whole world, to bring the Gentiles in. But the Jews didn't understand. They thought it was them and it was them only. They thought the Gentiles didn't have no way of being saved. So you have, you have to be a Jew in order to be saved. 
That's what the Jew thought in their mind. But God had a long, all along a plan to bring the Gentiles in. So what profit the Jew? Or what what profit is there of circumcision? Verse 2 says, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Or in every aspect. This is the answer of the apostle to the objection of Romans 3 and 1. That is, this is the principal advantage in what one including all others. The main benefit of being a Jew is to possess the sacred scriptures and their instruction. That's one of the main Jew, Jew, Jews we use over the Gentiles, that we got the word of God. We are the oracles of God. The word oracles mean you are the mouthpiece. So they, they think that the Gentiles have to obey things that they say that the Lord says. The Jews had many advantages in every way over the Gentiles because they were the chosen people but they misunderstood and didn't think the Gentiles would ever have a way to get in. Then it says unto them were committed or were entrusted were confided in. The word translated we're committed is what is commonly employed to express faith or to express confidence and it implied confidence in them on the part of God. Why? And God entrusted them with the oracle. He entrusted them with his word. He had confidence in, in them, which was not mis misplaced for those people. He told them, see, the Jews were supposed to guard the sacred trust of God's word. They were God's chosen people. They were the first people God chose to work with. That was the only advantage they had over the Gentile. The Jews had many advantages in every way. But when you read Romans 9, 1 through 5, the Bible says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Paul is saying, For I could wish that myself were accursed for Christ, from Christ, for my brother and my kinsmen according to the flesh. Then he goes on to say, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory? See, that pertaineth to the Jews right now. And the covenants and the giving of the law. The Jews had the law of God. The Gentiles didn't have it. And the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is overall God blessed forever. The Jews were one. One of them they had over the Gentiles was they were one the adoption as sons and daughters. The Jews had divine glory. They had the covenants of God. They were the receivers of the law. God made them the receivers and dispensers of his word. So what does this say to us? God has also entrusted us with his word. So just as the Jews were God chosen people, but now today, once we become a Christian, we become the chosen people of God. But you got to obey the commandments of God in order to become a child of His. The Jews were chosen by God from the beginning because they, they were the first one God chose to work with. But when He brought the Gentiles in, and Paul started teaching to the Gentiles and started stating to the Jews that you're up under sin just as they are up under sin, they brought some objection to the Jews. The Jews didn't agree them being up under sin, but they did agree about the Gentiles being up under sin. So we're looking at this from a court setting. Paul has come to a point where he's going to prove a final verdict to the Jews. And the final verdict is going to be that you are up under sin just as the Gentiles. The Jews have advantages over the Gentiles. But just as I said, God entrusted them with his word, but now he entrusts us with his word, he tells us in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, to go out and teach all nations. So just as the Jews had advantages, we have advantages to over the world. The world does not have God in their life like the Christian does. The only way you can get God to work in your life, you must become a child of his. That's why he sends us out to go out and teach the world. We got to teach the world so they can avoid having a family very brought on them negatively. 
Then the Jews we had then have a second we have a second objection. And that we be found in Romans three, verse three through four, where the Bible says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Verse four God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sin, and mightest overcome when thou art judge. The Bible says Paul is saying here in verse 3, he says, For what if some did not believe? See, that's an excuse. They're trying to think of a scenario to justify their, their self. See, what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? This is to be regarded as another objection of a Jew. What then? Or what follows? If it be admitted that some of the nation did not believe, does it not follow that the faithfulness of God in his promises will fail? The point of, of the objection is this. The apostle had maintained that the nation was sinful. That is, they had not obeyed or believed God. If some do not believe, what does the Bible tell them? You got to believe God. You got to have faith in God. You got to trust God. So when judgment comes, and you never believe God. What is God's faithfulness come promise is gonna fail? His promise is still there, but it's to those who believe and obey his word. Yeah, this is another objection of the Jew. For the first time they admit of or suppose in relationship to some of them. But he asked them, Well, this does not involve a consequence. Does your disbelief does it not involve a consequence to it? Is your disobedience to God? Does it involve a consequence? If we do either one of them, we don't trust God, we don't believe God, we don't obey God, there are consequences we're going to have to face. And in a court setting, if you break the law, there are consequences you're going to have to face in the court of law. If you are found guilty, at the final verdict, of your court case and you have found guilty there are some consequences you're going to have to face and on the day of judgment when God gives this final verdict if we have been disobedient to God we have trusted God we didn't show faith in God that there are some consequences we are going to have to face did not the fact that God chose them as his people and enter into a covenant with them, with the Jews, and practice the Jews should be kept from perdition. It was evidently that their belief that all Jews would be saved, and this belief they grounded on their covenant with their fathers. The Jews felt that since God made a covenant with them, we got content. We as Christians today, we can't get, get content. When we find things going well in the life. When God has blessed you with a great job. When God has blessed you with financial stability. Things seem to be falling into place. Do not get content. Because Satan is still lurking around. He just waiting for his opportunity. See when you get content. You tend to let your guard down. When you are content with things. You tend to become more casual. More you're not really checking your surroundings. You're kind of just going along with the flow. Then that's when sin, the Satan's going to creep in. He's going to throw a wrench into your life. But it's going to be such so deceivable that you still going to believe things are going well. Why? Because you, your lack of study goes down. Have you ever noticed that when things go well in your life, how less you study the Bible, how unless you start doing you stop you stop doing the Christian duties because you feel you got it made. You feel that God will excuse you, will exempt you from things. God never gives us the favorites not to study his word. He tells us to worship him every day. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. We gotta worship God without ceasing. We worship God seven days a week. Twenty four hours a day where we gotta sleep but we worship God seven days a week, not just on Sunday. 
the Jews got content with themselves because they were chosen of God. They were being blessed. They got the promises of God. They got the covenant with God. They got content with themselves. So has the faith, has the unfaithfulness of the Jews annulled God's purpose? Because they was unfaithful to God. Has God's purpose been affected? Does God's purpose change because of our unfaithfulness? Do he become lenient with us because we are unfaithful? No, God got a standard. And his standard is said that we got to reach. And if we are not striving to reach that standard, then it's on us when he makes his final verdict. Our failure is on our behalf, not on God's behalf. God's purpose does not change because we are unfaithful. We have chose to be unfaithful if we fail to reach the goal. The Jews is relying on the Old Testament when God told Abraham that he will bless his seed. The Jews base everything off being Abraham being their father. Not the father that God is, but Abraham was the father of all nations. So they go up on the Old Testament on Abraham and believe, relying on that, that they got it made. They felt the Jews felt that the notion that they could do whatever they wanted to do because God has already made the promise to them. But Paul came in teaching that the Jews, being without faith, caused them to be condemned. See, this is another thing, this is another thing that struck the Jews hard. Paul told them. You being without faith. And in their mind, they, this is bombado. This is boggling in their mind. That they are without faith. But they, they are thinking we are the chosen people of God. We got God's commandments. But their faith, the way they live their life, the way you live your life, shows how faithful you are. In God, it shows how strong your faith in God is. If you live like reckless, you don't have faith in God because you're not trusting His Word. If you try to do things on your own, you don't have faith in God. You try to do things without God's help. You're saying that God is failing you when things don't go your way. When you want something and God is not busy to get it. There may be a reason why God is not allowed this you need to receive that or making it hard for you to receive it. But then you go out the way to get it. So what do you got to do to go out the way to get it? It may cost a lot of money. So what do some people normally do? They'll take a well off. I give a little less money to God and I'll pay him back. But you take it from God but then you don't pay him back. What the Bible say? Would you rob God? When you take money from what what you're supposed to give God. You're robbing God. You're showing a lack of faith in God when you try to go about it to get whatever it is you want so badly. If God meant for you to have it, you would get it in the time that He gives it to you. But the Jews showed a lack of faith. They wasn't living their life right. They wasn't treating people right. So Paul, what Paul was saying made the Jews more Paul, their objection was, Paul, what you say makes the Jew more powerful than God. God purposed to bless the Jews. You, Paul, says he didn't because of the Jews' unfaithfulness. Israel went into captivity, in the Babylonian captivity. Why? Because of disobedience, their lack of faith. Every time the Jews find themselves in trouble, the Israel find themselves in trouble, it's because of their lack of faith. The Jews didn't realize it wasn't all about them. God was pointing them. He was bringing things to the point where you got to have faith in Him. You got to have trust in Him. You got to believe Him. That's why He did all the miracles that God did before the Israelites. They're the proof of them. Trust me. I will bring you through. Look at what we came through. Look at what you came through. You came to the rain. You were hungry, thirsty. I gave you water from a rock. Miraculous. A miracle. He did before them. 
came to the Red Sea, Pharaoh had him trapped at the Red Sea. He parted the Red Sea. They crossed over on dry ground. A miraculous miracle. Trust me. Believe me, God saying. You got to have faith in me. But every time they came to a situation, their lack of faith showed up. Murmuring against God. They showed a lack of faith. Paul says, your faith caused you to be condemned. When we show a lack of faith, in God, in whatever it is that's going on in our life. When we show a lack of faith, we're causing ourselves to be condemned by our unfaithfulness. When we don't do God's will, that is being unfaithful to God. Because them Jews' lack of faith condemned, caused them to be condemned. But when the Jews said, Paul, what you say makes a Jew more powerful than God, God preps to bless the Jews. You said Paul says he didn't because of the Jews' unfaithfulness. Well, Paul answer to them was man's unfaithfulness cannot make God untrue to his promises. See, your unfaithfulness is not going to make God go back on his promises. His promises are still there. But you just, we just got to do things to get to his promises. If we're not doing what God says, we're not being faithful to God. We're not going to receive his promises. But the promises are still there. Our unfaithfulness it cannot make God untrue to his promises. God promised to bless the faithful. He never promised to bless the Jew. His promise was to bless the faithful. In just 18 and 19, the Bible says, For I know him, that he will command his children. He's speaking about Abraham. Abraham was the father of all nations. Abraham had such great faith. God told Abraham to give me your son, give me Isaac, sacrifice Isaac to me. Abraham, as much I know, it deep inside him. He was hating how to, to sacrifice his son, but Abraham knew that just as God blessed him to receive that son, that God can give him back. The Bible doesn't say he did that, but Abraham's faith was so great <coughs> that, that God said, I know him. He said, I know Abraham. He knew Abraham because Abraham was faithful. He knew Abraham by his faith. He would command his children and his household after me. And they, his household, shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring, what? Upon Abraham that which he has spoken. See, he promised Abraham I'm going to multiply, I see, you're going to be the father of many nations, all nations. And God said, I know him. And that the Lord, he's going to bring about upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. The Bible also tells us the only way we can please God is by faith. Israel condemned themselves because of their lack of faith. They didn't please God. That's why they found themselves in Babylonian captivity. That's why they find themselves getting to, into trouble constantly because of their lack of faith. When you constantly having trouble in your life, when things are constantly going bad in your life, check your faith. Where is your faith? Is your faith strong in God? Do you have faith in God? We have to check our faith. Faith to see where it is at. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 6, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, if we're going to please God, we got to be seeking God. We got to be diligently seeking God. And by us diligently seeking God, we must believe that he is. That he is a what? That he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And when you're seeking God, your faith is strong. Without faith, we can't please God. So we cannot expect to be blessed if we are unfaithful. The Jews were the chosen people of God, but they was unfaithful. Their unfaithfulness caused them to be condemned. In our day and time, our unfaithfulness will cause us 
us to be condemned. When you on your job working, you got to show faith in God. When we see bad news on TV, you got to show faith in God and talk positive. You can't be having that sorrow and sadness when you see the negativity that's going on in the world. What's the world coming to, boy? We just ain't going to make it. I don't see how we're going to make it. We as Christians can have, have that mindset. We as Christians must have the mindset that we serve a God that is able. And we got to show to the world that we trust in God. And we're not worried about the things. Now, physically, now understand what I'm saying. When I say we're not worried, now we can, we, we, we are human, we are physical. And things will affect us in, in certain ways. But we don't go to the deepness of worry that the world go through. To think that there's no way out. We know there is a way. But we got to show it to the world and get the world to accept the way. And that is putting your faith in God to take care of all our needs. When you trust God and you show Him trust, He takes care of the thing that's bugging you things that's bothering you, the things that's hindering you, God will take care of them. You will receive His promises, but you got to show faith in Him. You can't please Him without faith. Our unbelief will cause us to be condemned. The Jews were the chosen people of God, but not all of the Jews believed. So their unbelief caused them not to receive the blessings. If we don't believe, and we don't be faithful, we too shall be in danger of not receiving the promises of God. We too would be like those Jew Israelites were when God said about them in Romans 10 and verse 21. But Israel, he said, all day long I have stretched forth my hand unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. See, he said to Israel, I had my hand stretched out to you the whole time. All day I'm stretching my hands out. For you to grab on. But you are a disobedient. You are a gangsaying people. The NIV said you are obstinate. You are a contrary people. You are not faithful. So we must be faithful. If we are going to receive the promises of God. We can't be like those Israelites. In the Old Testament. For the Bible tells us the Old Testament. Written for our learning. So what, we, what that means is we got to look. And study the Bible. And look at what they did and learn from what how they responded to God. Well, we don't make the same mistake that they made. The Old Testament is there for our learning. So we must be faithful. The Bible says in Romans 3, 5 to 6, where we find the Jews' third objection. In verse 5, it says, But if our unrighteousness commend the unrighteousness of God, and what shall we say? Is God unrighteous? Who taketh vengeance? Paul says, I speak as a man. Very easy to say, but God forbid. God said, no. For then how shall God judge the world? If God is unrighteous towards us, how would he be to judge us if he was unrighteous? No, he is not unrighteous. We are the unrighteous one. We got to come up to God's word. We got to reach the bar that God got sent. We got to be faithful. We got to be obedient to God. We got to show faith in order to please God. We got to have faithfulness. So we, if we are unfaithful, we're going to face the same circumstance that the Israelites did. We're going to be condemned. Our unfaithfulness will condemn us to where we don't receive the promises of God. The Jews are still trying to make a plea, though. They are still relying on the fact that we are the chosen people of God. They are still trying to make a plea that they still have the promises of God. See, when you... See, God in Romans 1 talks about He going to send a delusion to man. He can make your mind a rip of mind to where you think you still receive the promises. See, the Jews, even though He had made that, the New Testament hadn't been written yet, the Jews was feeling that consequence of having a reprobate mind. Because they felt that they 
will still have the promises of God, even without the without faith. They're still making the plea, and that it will be that would be wrong if God punished them for their sins. Now they are saying, God, if you punish us, you are wrong. They are accusing God of doing something wrong. Why? Because they do not want to be obedient. They do not want to obey what God has said for them to do. They are showing a lack of faith. And their lack of faith has condemned them to not receive the promises. So now they're trying to say that God would be wrong if he punished them for their sins. See, this sounds like today. We have people today who are so entitled. Feel that things should just be handed to them. They can do no wrong. A person with an entitled attitude like that. Feel that they can do no wrong. That they should be punished for their for their wrongful doing. They are condemning themselves to not be able to receive the promises of God. If we don't fulfill God's word, Paul has said that our unrighteousness it commends the righteousness of God. See, by you being unrighteous, it's proving that God is righteous. <laughs> we cannot keep His commandments because we are unrighteous people. We need a God to have grace and mercy and love for us that sent his son down here to wash our sins away. To send his son, his son is not a mediator between us and God. His son is there, is our lawyer. Jesus is the defense lawyer. Satan is the prosecutor. See, Satan is bringing all the accusations against us in God's court. But Jesus is there defending us, defending our, all our sins, taking all our sins on his shoulder, putting his life on the line for us. He said, I'm going out on the line and standing up and saying that y'all are good people. But yet, how do we treat God Jesus? So Paul has said that our right commends the righteousness of God. So when God judges unrighteousness, it magnifies and it exalts his righteousness. Well, how does it do that? See, sin increases man's appreciation for the goodness and holiness of God. See, when we sin and we find ourselves in situations, things are going wrong in our lives. What, do, what does this do? What does it normally do? When things go right, something drastic happens in your life. What does it do? It moves you to, I better get right with God. When a person gets sent to prison, why don't a lot of them get in prison? And a lot of them come back claiming, oh, I found Jesus. Because of what they did, the sinfulness, their wrongness, they faced the bottom of life. It pushed them to appreciate what Jesus did for them. See, when we sin, and we honestly admit and see our sin, and we hold ourselves accountable for our sin with a lot of people today, cannot without hold themselves accountable for anything. But when we hold ourselves accountable for what we did wrong, we show more appreciation for the goodness and the holiness of God. Because then we see where God sent Jesus and given us another chance. Men's lives are disciplined through the sorrow suffered because of sin. When you suffer, when you suffer sorrow, it's disciplining you. That sorrow is discipline. That's God discipline, disciplinary action toward you. Allowing you, allow you to go through the sorrow. To teach you a lesson. So you can learn from what you go through. Now when he brings you through it. And he forgives you of your sin. And you come out your sin. You can you confess your sin to God. Come out living a better life. You look back and you appreciate God more. Now, through the pitiful, pitiful experiences, we learn what we he, we should have known all the time. Have you ever noticed that when you come through some stuff, and God blesses you and forgives you, and you look back on it, you think to yourself, I should have known better to do it. I knew I shouldn't do it all along, but I did it anyway. And you ask that, why did I do that? See, we, we, we learn from what we should have known all, uh, all the time. That God's word is altogether true and in his favor. That the wages of sin is death. 
Hey, you notice that how when you sin, how sorrowful you get. Then you go through the fall of life and sin. And then you reminisce on the things you've done. And then you appreciate the goodness of God. If God didn't punish us or the Jews, then then for their unrighteousness, Romans 3 6 says that that would make it impossible for God to judge the world. If he let them off the hook, let them do wrong, and then punish them. And then we comes along. How could he judge us? It's it would be making it possible for God to judge the world. For what if some do not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Romans 3 7 said that that would make it impossible for them to call Paul a sinner. Paul was the chiefest of sinners. Paul said himself, How can he be a sinner if his work causes people to glorify God? Romans 3 says, Why don't we teach? Let us do evil. That good may come. Simply, if the more evil I do, the more good I receive, then let me go out here and do evil. God said, no. God does not, does not abide. He does not condone doing evil to, in order to receive more good. No. Once he was forgiven of your sin, you got to refrain from doing evil. The Jews couldn't do that. Because they were hung up on themselves. They felt that they were the chosen people of God. That they can do whatever they want. Because then they will be joining with the Gentiles. And blaspheming. By saying let us do evil that good may come. There are seven things we need to remember about God. One. The very words of God. He entrusted. And entrusted. We are entrusted with the word of God. Two. Our faithfulness of God. God faithfulness is true always. You need to accept that. You need to remember that. Remember the righteousness of God. God's righteousness is always should be magnified. Four, the judgment of God. God will judge the world. Five, the truthfulness of God and the glory of God. The Jews didn't remember these things about God or else they wouldn't have had all these objections. Now that we have learned the objection the Jews had. We now enter the final phase of this court case. The final verdict. Romans 3 verse 9 says. What then? Are we better than they? And Paul says no. And no why. For we have before. Proved both Jews and Gentiles. That we are all under sin. Yes the Jews you have proven. That you are under sin. Both of us have proven that. With or without the law, both Jew and Gentile alike are concluded under sin. So everybody in the world is under sin. God said the character of mankind is sin. We don't know nothing but sin. God says the, the dominion of mankind is all under sin. Everything we do, every, everything we control is sin. God says the extent of this verdict is universal for all of mankind. All is under sin. I'm making a verdict, my final verdict, that all of y'all are under, are under sin. But if you read verses 10 through 18, you'll see God is proving his verdict by scripture. We have sin in our human character, verse 10 through 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's verse 10. Verse 11, there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Verse 12, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. We all are under sin. None of us does good. That's why you had to send Jesus. There is none that understand. None of us understand. There is none who seek God. When you don't seek God, there is none that does good. Because we have sin in our character that we need to get out. To get it out, we got to see God. Because God will have the final verdict. See, we got to understand that at the end of the time, day, the final word is going to be from God. Not only do we have sin in our character, 
their sin and our conduct, the way we conduct ourselves, is sinful. Look at what's going on today. Look at how young people and the late women act, and young people, women and men are acting today. Sin is in our character, is in our conduct. Romans 33, 13 through 18, the Bible says, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongue, they have used deceit. The poison of the apple is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing mm, and bitterness. Look, listen to people's mouths today. Their feet are swift to shed blood. The slightest little thing what to do. People pull the gun out and shoot. They drive and shoot into a crowd. Their sixty said, destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. How do you conduct yourself at work? Or whenever you out and about? What is it that people hear coming from your mouth? Do they hear good things? Or do they hear vile talking from your mouth? Is there any deceit or poison on your tongue? Are you using your lips for gossiping? Or you using your mouth for blasphemy? Because remember, God, we have, remember God have the final verdict. Verse 15 through 17 is talking about our deeds. Our feet are swift to carry us to the place where blood is shed. Our ways, wherever we go, we leave destruction and misery. The reason mankind do these things is because there is no fear of God before their eyes. And when you don't fear God, then there is nothing you won't do. Because there's no boundary set for you. This type of person don't doesn't realize that God will have the final verdict. We gotta have God has set boundaries. And we gotta honor the boundaries that God has set. We gotta stop allowing Satan to influence our minds, to conduct ourselves the way we conduct ourselves. You look around at the world. Look how these young Girls and boys are conducting themselves. Look at how they dress. The language they use. Look how they disrespect the elders. They disrespect their own parents. God is going to have a final verdict. I hope the listening language was beneficial to you. And uh, you got something out of it. I just pray God will be with you the rest of this evening. And the rest of the days of our lives. But, and I pray God that you will allow the word to permeate your mind. Let us say a closing prayer and we will close for the night. Heavenly Father, we come thank you for today. We come thank you for life and the strength, Father. Father, we come thank you for blessing us to have this Bible study tonight to learn that you are the judge and that you're going to have a final say. You're going to have a final verdict at the end of the day. That we must show a faith in you. We must let our faith be strong so that we're not condemned to death. We got to make sure our faith, that we are living a life, that we don't be like the Israelites, the Jews, who show the lack of faith. Who are condemned to be unfaithful because they will, will trust in you, believe in you, bless those who have heard the, the study tonight. They will be better to their lives, they apply it to their lives, Father. See you, Son, just make me pray and ask all these things. Amen.